Ooh, I think we're live. We are live. How's it going? Good. good. How's your day? I'm good. Good. Enjoying this Louisiana weather. A lot of rain, a lot of humidity. Mm. A lot of my skin, but not the hair too much, but happy to be here. Yes, me too. Um, thank y'all for joining us again for another Criminal Justice Live. I'm Brianna, a writer at Push Black. Hi, y'all. I'm Darren, a content strategist here at Push Black. Yeah, and we're very excited. Um, drop a comment letting us know where y'all are joining from tonight, and we're going to get into it. Um, so this week, we're going to be talking about Mayor Eric Adams, New York City's mayor, and his pro-police efforts. So despite how much we all love feeling represented, when it comes to policing, having Black faces in high places ain't doing us any favors. Today, we'll look at NYC's Mayor Eric Adams, a 22-year veteran cop whose pro-police policies are harming unhoused Black people. Um, we'll also dig a bit into the history of Black politicians elected in moments of mass Black resistance, um, similar to now, such as the 1960s Black power era, um, and how this history continues to affect us today. Word, word. Thank you so much for the intro on this, Bree. Um, just to get us grounded for folks who are joining us who may be unfamiliar, I'm wondering if you could share a little bit of background around who is Eric Adams. Yeah, of course. So as I mentioned, Eric Adams is an ex-cop uh, who spent 22 years on the NYPD. So it's a very important place we start this conversation um, before he turned to politics and it shows in how he is today as mayor. So according to an article from Politico, Adams' first day in office started with a call to 911 from a subway platform to report a fight among a group of men. He's been known to rush to the hospital where shot police officers are being treated for gun wounds. Um, and he's also headed to police headquarters to announce an arrest in the armed robbery death of a young Burger King cashier. So he is very in the mix. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the mayor's tendency to always be on the scene isn't an accident. Um, it's a part of the, you know, his whole PR thing. He's trying to signal his personal investment in the safety of NYC. Um, but many have pointed out that he's still just thinking and acting like a, a cop, which is placing too much trust into the police force and particularly uh, the NYPD, a police force with a long history of abusing our people and violence against our people and lots of people, um, instead of working to improve social services and conditions that we'll talk about like home, uh, houselessness. Um, so just like with the police, Eric Adams standing on an NYC street corner, he's been known to do, is not gonna stop crime from happening. We know that the police don't make us safer they don't stop or prevent crime, and they rarely solve violent crimes. Mm -hmm. So let's consider Eric Adams' pro-police logic. Um, with this logic, if having a larger police force makes us safe, then by his logic and many others, the U.S. would already be the safest society in the world, right? With over $115 billion spent on policing in one year. So none of it is adding up. Um, wow. Mm -hmm. Wow, thank you so much for that, Bree. So you mean to tell me he's like pretty much running around like Batman, um, yeah. <laughs> trying to be as visible as possible. Um, yeah. maybe that he himself is bringing safety to the streets. Okay. Yep. Wow. Yep. Thank you for that history. Definitely. And so, Darren, let let the people know why should we, uh, our black the black community, be concerned with Mayor Adams. Ooh, well, a number of reasons, but let's just take a look at what he's promised while he was on the campaign trail. So it's interesting, um, Eric Adams, while he was running for mayor of New York City, uh, he presented these extensive policy platforms uh, with many big progressive promises. However, what's interesting to note, Bree, not long after he actually was elected as mayor, the whole Adams campaign took down their website, right? So all the campaign promises that he was throwing out to people, you really can't find that, right? Um, however, we can still access the links to all of his campaign promises, which were saved by the Gotham Gazette, if anyone's interested. So with that said, let's just take a quick look at a few of his campaign promises. So let's just start with housing. What does he promise to deliver us? So he's promised to provide homes and help for houseless persons and those struggling with rent. 
Um, he's also advocated for upzoning wealthier areas where the city can build far more affordable units. He's advocated for repurposing city office buildings and hotels for affordable housing, as well as filling empty affordable apartments with priority house, unhoused New Yorkers. Mm -hmm. The second big campaign platform of his was police reform. Now, those who've been joining us for these past lives know the history of police reforms, but let's just take a look at how Mayor Adams tries to frame it. He really believes, as articulated through his campaign promises, that the fastest way, this is an exact quote, the fastest way to true reform is to add as much diversity to the NYPD as fast as we can while building trust through transparency. And he really claims this can be achieved by adding black and brown officers who will respect and protect New Yorkers, appointing the city's first woman police commissioner, making it easier for good cops, good cops to identify bad cops, and publicizing the list of cops being monitored for bad behavior. And he's also included empowering communities to have a say in their precinct leadership. Hmm. Now, with that said, let's actually take a look at what he's actually delivered in his first months, first eight months on the job. So let's just start with the Tough on Crime campaign platform. Now, one of Mayor Adams' most controversial actions to date is his decision to reinstate the NYPD's plainclothes unit that was actually disbanded by former Mayor Bill de Blasio after the division was implicated in multiple police-involved shootings and assaults. This actually included the 2014 chokehold death of Eric Gardner. Now, in 2013, a landmark ruling found the NYPD's use of stop and frisk was unconstitutional, right? All the racial profiling and targeting. But now, nearly two years after the murder of George Floyd forced a national reckoning on race and policing, Mayor Adams is now talking about putting more officers on the street. Mm -hmm. And he's also talking about protecting police department budgets from cuts and possibly reinstating a legal version of stop and frisk. Now, in addition to all this, Adams has plans to roll back aspects of the bail reform that was passed in New York in 2019. Many activists and organizers celebrated that as a win. However, Mayor Adams argues that judges should be able to keep defendants in jail before trial if they believe they're dangerous. And he's pushing to be able to charge 16 and 17 year olds caught with guns as adults, you know. Now, we really know the consequences of this particular bail reform proposal in light of the tragedy of Khalid Browder. Mm -hmm. Those who may be unfamiliar with the, um, the tragedy of Khalid Browder, he was held at Rikers Island, um, which is a jail, not a prison, y'all, it's a jail complex, without trial. And he was held there between 2010 and 2013 for allegedly still in a backpack containing valuables. And during his imprisonment here, Ryder was actually held in solitary confinement for 700 days, y'all. Yeah. So lastly, one thing I wanna talk about with respect to Mayor Adams' tough on crime platform as he's been enacting it since he's been in office, he's actually spearheading a public relations campaign to urge not only New Yorkers, but all Americans to support the police as he's proposed raising police spending by nearly $200 million. Now, I'm thinking back to what you were sharing, Bree, around how visible this mayor likes to be in terms of wanting to communicate this sense of public safety, right? It really feels like this big public relations stick that really is trying to brand policing right now. Yeah. So just thinking about this proposed nearly $200 million increase to the NYPD budget, I think it's important to note what the NYPD's nearly, uh, what their yearly budget is today, right? Uh, you wanna take a guess what the NYPD yearly budget is, Bree? Okay, I got it wrong last time. So I'm gonna go higher and say, I know it's in the billions, let's say like 3 billion. Okay, 3 billion. Uh, well, it's 6 billion right now. Um, mm -hmm. And this mayor is proposing adding another $200 million to this budget. Um, just to put this in perspective, y'all, the NYPD's budget is already higher than the entire military budget of Ukraine. And that country actually has a population five times that of New York City. Hmm. Really makes no sense. Ah. So just to dig a little bit further into the relationship of leasing and also the housing prices and how Mayor Adams is actually exacerbating this, Bree, I'm wondering what you can share around what Mayor Adams has done to actually affect the current housing crisis. Yeah, so um, a lot. New York City Mayor Eric Adams already deployed NYPD officers to clear out unhoused people from subway stations, but 
he also has his sights set on erasing New Yorkers from the streets by destroying housing encampments, which he's done, like tents, boxes, and other makeshift shelters. Um, from March 18th to May 1st, the city carried out 733 cleanups across the five boroughs, according to data sent to NPR by the mayor's office. After engaging with 264 people, 39 of them accepted temporary housing. Um, so these, you can imagine these cleanups are literally um, pushing unhoused people out of one place to go where. Um, yeah. Yeah, and everybody yeah. doesn't want to go to the temporary housing, you know, and we know that the temporary housing is not really what it should be. So mm -hmm. Adam's yeah. response to detractors left our own head shaken. He shared, I'm not abandoning. I'm not abandoning anyone. I'm not going to believe that dignity is living in a cardboard box. It's just so inhumane, said Adams, which is ironic. He also said, you have a right to sleep on the street. You don't have a right to build a miniature house. So he's literally forcing people into a worse situation than they started with, right? Mm -hmm. um, where are these people supposed to go? And Adams has no solution for that. Um, he's also following in the terrible footsteps of former Mayor Rudy Galani. I don't know if I'm saying it right, but Rudy G. Yeah. Yeah, something like that, who in 1993 ran his own campaign um, on making this country's best city safe again. That was his promise. But he actually introduced this terrible theory called the broken windows theory. Um, and it's a theory on policing, which meant that if police tackled smaller signs of disorder um, in a community like, say, broken windows, bigger issues like murder and violence will also stop. So that's what the NYPD did um, from subway fare, people jumping the turnstiles and subways to unhoused people to graffiti artists. Literally nobody was safe under this theory. And to this day, um, that former mayor claims he saved New York, which you know is not true. But in reality, way more black people end up ended up incarcerated under his um, term. For example, misdemeanor arrests for marijuana increased by 6,430%. Wow. Yeah, that's a lot um, during uh, this mayor's time. And so the broken windows theory actually ended up developing into stop and frisk, which we know that Mayor Adams is a proponent of. So and at its peak, stop and frisk had 685,000 stops in one year. So these things are very much connected um, and they're like an avalanche, you know, of anti-blackness and criminalization of our people. Um, and the two definitely go together. So to dig more into our current housing crisis, um, you may be wondering how does houselessness affect our communities? And here's how. Today, Black people have the highest rate of houselessness in New York City and nationwide. So in New York specifically, which we're highlighting today because we're talking about Mayor Adams, he's a mayor of New York City, um, homelessness or houselessness, sorry, in New York City has reached its highest level since the Great Depression, which was in the 1930s. Wow. Um, and Black and Hispanic residents are disproportionately affected. Um, the nonprofit coalition for homeless reported that about 57% of heads of households in shelters are Black. Wow. On a nationwide scale, um, since the HUD's annual homeless assessment report began, they've revealed that the vast disproportion of unhoused Black Americans compared to our U.S. population. So we are only 12.3% of the total U.S. population, yet we make up 39.6% of all sheltered house, unhouseless people, or sorry, houseless people. In 2019, the latest, which is the latest information from this assessment, um, the AHAR states that African Americans accounted for 40%, which is about 225,000, of all people experiencing houselessness in 2019, and 52% of people experiencing houselessness as members of families with children, despite, again, only being 13% of the U.S. population. So we see this like disproportionate amount of us being unhoused. And it ties directly to incarceration, where we're also the majority that's incarcerated. So all of these things are intentional and systemic, which we want to remind folks of. Um, so the government's already, you know, undercounting the unhoused population by the millions. 
And so politicians like Adams, who claim to care about safety and unhoused people, um, they claim to care about our safety, but actually unhoused people are targets of, you know, violence from civilians, but also the police are harming these people. Mm. So with all that we've learned so far about Mayor Eric Adams, let's take a look at the history of Black electoral politics and how this has actually served our communities or not. Yes, indeed. Oh, my goodness. Um, yeah, let's talk about Black faces in high places, y'all. Um, so there was a recent New York Times opinion piece titled The End of Black Politics. It was written by Kianga Yamada Taylor. For those who may be unaware of Kianga Yamada Taylor, they are an American academic, activist, and writer. And she argued that the disparities between the leaders of the Congressional Black Caucus and organizers on the ground signify the limitations of progressive representation in mainstream political spheres, right? Just think back to one of Eric Adams' campaign proposals to put um, a Black woman in charge uh, or make a Black woman the commissioner of the NYPD. Think about the power of representation. Now, in her piece, The End of Black Politics, she writes about how the Black insurgency of the 1960s and the subsequent Voting Rights Act really laid the basis for the pivot to Black electoral politics during the 1970s. Wow. They believe they're dangerous. Black insurgency of the 1960s. Sorry. <laughs> it was the Facebook feed playing on here, my bad. Oh, no, no. It's all good. It's all good. Mm -hmm. um, so during this time, so in 1960s and 1970s, there were fewer than 1,500 Black elected officials. So entering the political office was part of this broader political strategy to try to really achieve equality, right? To have more Black representation in our political sphere. Now, the Congressional Black Caucus was formed out of this during this era, and its members really considered themselves the consciousness or the conscience of Congress and saw themselves as representing the political interests of all Black America. However, after legal segregation ended, and as more Blacks entered the middle class, political demands actually started to kind of shift here. So Black elected officials were actually more in tune with the needs of their middle class constituencies, Black and white, than they were with the actual needs of Black working class persons. So increasingly, we saw Black elected officials were seen as managing crises, right, upheavals in Black working class communities, instead of actually leading efforts to root out these social inequities. So for instance, to kind of crystallize this, um, in 1994, the Congressional Black Caucus who claims you're the conscious of Congress, right? 94, they played a key role in the passage of the notorious crime bill, which is widely viewed as a pivotal turn towards mass incarceration. And really in doing so, right? And the Congressional Black Caucus actually advocating for this, they actually had the support of African-American mayors from Denver to Cleveland to Detroit to Atlanta and many other major municipalities. So today we can see there are actually more black, black elected officials than ever before. However, that has not been enough to contain coronavirus, right? Which has ravaged black communities. Um, and it also hasn't worked to keep us safe in general. So the Congressional Black Caucus has actually continued to offer very familiar lists of police reforms that have continually failed us decades after decades to end police violence. Now, with that said, I wanna take a look at some contemporary examples of uh, some similar black mayors who are kind of moving in a light very familiar to Eric Adams. So let's just take a look at Mayor Lori Lightfoot. Um, so she's mayor of the third largest city in the country of Chicago. In 2019, Chicago swore in its first black woman and first openly gay mayor, Lori Lightfoot. Now it's important to note here that Lightfoot is actually a former federal prosecutor and considered herself a political outsider. And she ran a campaign of fairness and inclusion. However, on, her, on the other hand, her opposition at this time really painted her as complicit in police involved shootings and a racist criminal justice system. Her, her controversial history was really overshadowed by the praise of um, the city's kind of progressive acceptance of Lightfoot's identity. But, it's really important to note that Lightfoot's responses to civil disobedience has really left many on the ground activists and organizers questioning her political or progressive identity alongside her regressive policies. So for example, during the first weekend of the George Floyd uprisings, all but one of Chicago's seven drawbridges were lifted in an effort to limit the mobility of protesters in and out of downtown, right? Effectively trapping them. So once she did this, she actually enacted a 9 p.m. curfew 
and it was announced at a press conference, which left protesters only 45 minutes to travel home. And this resulted in many, many arrests, people just exercising their First Amendment right, right? So in addition to this, protesters cried to defund the police and instead divert those funds to institutions actually designed to actually serve Black and Indigenous communities actually have not been heard by Lightfoot at all. Mm. Instead, Lightfoot announced a better training program and wellness services for officers and a new recruit education initiative focused on police community relations. Now, this initiative also included a proposed $95 million police academy training center on the west side of Chicago. To make matters worse, over the course of the pandemic, Chicago actually could have invested in school safety, they can improve ventilation, masks for all, more testing centers, mm-hmm. ongoing vaccination, things of that nature, right? Um, but instead, Lightfoot actually gave 60% of COVID relief funds to the police. Now, lastly, to just kind of bring this home, in light of the housing crisis, as you just elucidated for us all, Bree, it's really important to know that Mayor Lightfoot has also greenlighted a controversial $6 billion Lincoln Yards retail and housing development project. Mm. And she greenlighted this at the same time that many of the city's black residents are actually struggling to find affordable housing and they're facing a public school system that's declining in quality across the board, y'all. Now this Lincoln Yards project, (laughs) to make it even more egregious, it would actually use $1.3 billion collected through Chicago's unique tax increment financing system, which was originally built to serve blighted areas. Now, while these funds were intended to close the gap between communities of color, and intergenerationally generated wealth, the Lincoln Yards Development Project seems to divert this funding away from Chicago public schools and other critical critical public institutions in favor of building this commercial complex in a predominantly white and affluent area. So really throughout all these examples, even folks we haven't mentioned, like uh, let's say former Attorney General uh, Loretta Lynch or Eric Holder or even Obama, I really truly believe we can see that Black faces in high places really has done nothing to mitigate police violence, abuse, or bring us to any closer sense of justice as a people. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that, Darren. That was really helpful to like bring everything together. And I know we keep having these conversations, but every time I hear a billion something, my mind is just blown all over again because- Even if we were talking about millions, it would still be terrible. But the fact that it's like an astronomical amount of money being spent on something that we know is not making our communities safer, it's just wild to me that everybody just keeps looking over the facts. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And there's a small thing that came up when you were speaking about um, Mayor Adams' cleanup efforts. Uh, yeah. It's just really alarming that they even call them cleanups. Right. You know, as if like these living, breathing persons are just like trash that needs to be removed and placed elsewhere. It really kind of crystallizes their ideology around unhoused persons, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. And um, I was just peeping in the comments and um, one of the earlier ones we got from RJ Sr. says the police are not our friends and that budget is just ridiculous. Six billion. That's sick. Yeah, it's, it's wow, yo, $6 billion. And as we mentioned, that's more than the entire military budget of Ukraine, who's at war right now. And they have, I think what they said, five times the population of the city. Uh, yeah. So there seems to be no correlation between that investment in policing and actual public safety, as we all know. Yeah. So, yeah. One last comment, someone said, um, like I was telling my son, my, Mache V. White, like I was telling my son, all money ain't good money. That's mm. true. The same applies here. Not all Black people are good for Black people. And um, thank you for that point, um, because that was a lot of this conversation. We wanted to, we're not trying to tear, you know, our people down. We're all for the people, but we're for people that are for us. Yes. And we just wanted to really reiterate that um, and use Mayor Adams as an example of how, you know, we have to be critical of, and not even critical of, we got to know who we put in office before they even get there, right? So, yeah, yeah, I love this conversation. Um, Yeah, thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us. So just to kind of wrap up, let's reiterate, 
politicians like Mayor Eric Adams aren't working in the best interests of our people, despite being from our community. So when we take to the polls, we must know who's truly for us and the betterment of our entire community. Anyone can have anti-Black policies, and we shouldn't look the other way when politicians like Adams or Lightfoot and their pro-police policies are actually working against us. Now, neoliberalism uses identity politics to garner support from minority populations, when in reality, as we discussed today, they really only operate on the basis of corporate class interests. And we really can't assume those who share the same identity as us share the same concerns, vulnerabilities, and politics. Yeah, definitely. We deserve to live in a world without state sanctioned violence. Um, no correlation between police funding and public safety exists, especially if police, as police have proven over and over again to be public danger. Um, abolitionists have a different view of what causes crime in the world. They and we imagine America would spend much more on education, health care, and infrastructure and nothing on police departments as we currently know them. Yes, so, thanks so much for joining us, y'all. I'm Bree. I'm Darren. Um, and tune in next week. We'll be here live again, same time, same place. Um, be sure to go on Facebook and turn on your notifications so that you can know when we're live. And yeah, we'll see you then. We'll see you thanks. next week, y'all. Thank you. Bye.